Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, What are the Current Advances in Flow Cytometry, presented by J. Paul Robinson, Ph.D. I'm Judy O'Rourke of Lab Roots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're excited to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Lab Roots and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this presentation is interactive. We want to hear from you. Questions, comments, and even answers can be submitted via the green Q&A button at the lower left of your screen. We'll try to get to everyone, but if not, we will make sure to follow up with you by email. You can also enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you cannot hear or see this presentation properly, let us know by clicking on the support button at the top right or the Q&A button in the lower left. I now present today's speaker, J. Paul Robinson, Ph.D., the SVM Professor of Cytomics in the College of Veterinary Medicine and a Professor of Biomedical Engineering in the Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering at Purdue University. I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Robinson. Well, thank you, Judy, and welcome to all of you to this uh, discussion on advances in flow cytometry. What I want to do before I get into the details of the webinar <coughs> is give a small background on flow cytometry, and I realize that a lot of you will be probably experts in the field, but there's always some people who are not, and I don't want to go um, past those individuals. So flow cytometry has been around for a long time, over 50 years. And it started out with just one or two parameters. And that's important for today's discussion because it's now moved to a large number of parameters, from 10 to 25 parameters might be a possibility and I think will increase over the years. Now, most flow cytometry is going to be around the 5 to 15 parameters, and that's the general area that I'm going to talk about today. So flow cytometry, as most of you know, measures single cells. It's the most unique technology for measuring single cells, and the reason is it can evaluate properties of each population, of a mixed population, without physically separating those cells. That's a pretty powerful capacity uh, for a technology that can look at single cells. And while it does that, it creates a strong basis for statistical analysis. That means that we can actually quantitate uh, information in each of those um, populations that we might be going to measure. Now, the things that you can measure are either extracellular receptors, typically immunophenotyping, or you can measure intracellular components. Look at DNA or other uh, subcellular organelles or molecules produced in the cell or on the cell, so there's a lot of things that you can do with this technology. Now, no technology is perfect. Uh, there are limitations in everything. And I, I want to just mention six limitations because I'll be discussing most of these during the webinar with respect to the Attune. First of all, sensitivity. The uh, system has to have detectors capable of measuring the number of molecules of the marker that that you've you've attached a fluorochrome to, and so sensitivity above background becomes important. Concentration, sample concentration, and flow rate those can be really complicated issues in flow cytometry, and they will will get you one day or the other that your sample is to concentrated or not concentrated enough, and uh, that will cause you some problem, and we've all faced that issue over the years. Sample volume. What happens if you just simply don't have very much volume? What do you do? And that's an interesting question because when we talk about flow cytometry, I, I can guarantee you that we always say, look, flow cytometry is fantastic because you can look at such small volumes. And this is true, except that 
um, if you only have a few microliters of sample, uh, then it's not so easy to actually run it on most flow cytometers. And then the other issue is the number of samples per hour that you might have. Um, we typically have run tubes over the years in flow cytometers. But today we move to plates. And so we need to look at issues of what is the potential flow rate? What's the sample rate? Not just the flow rate. How many samples can you run per hour? Not just how many samples can you run per hour, but how many samples can you run per hour and get good data from? Then number five there is the number of parameters and colors. And I indicated that you know, a lot of instruments are now coming on market that, that are in this range of five to 15 parameters, which seems to me to be a, a pretty popular range. And that's because we've really developed some good assays where we can um, get assays running with a fairly small number of cells and still be able to look at a vast number of parameters. The last thing is a tricky issue, and that is looking at the size of particles, small or large particles. And that's a, a tough one for a lot of flow cytometers. So looking at very, very small particles is something that I, I'm seeing a lot of flow cytometry doing. And so I, I anticipate we'll, we'll be looking more at that area. So for the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to discuss my experience with the Attune. And the, uh, the last several months, I've had the opportunity of, of playing with the Attune in my lab. And I've spent quite a bit of time with uh, colleagues who, who have this instrument and, of course, my lab staff uh, who've been using it. And I thought that this would be a good opportunity to outline some of the features that, <clears throat> that I, particular, I find attractive, actually, uh, about the Attune uh, instrument. And I'll discuss some of the unique advantages of the technology because there are, in, in every instrument, there's, there's usually something that is really quite unique on that instrument. And, and there's a couple of things on the Attune that, that I'd, I'd like to share uh, with you. And I'll try to expand on some of those issues because I have discussed this with a number of uh, people and I've found that some people don't quite understand exactly how the technology works. So my goal will be to try to outline that in a fairly easy to understand way. Now, I'd like to put this picture up. It's a picture of Hal Shapiro. I think you probably all know him and you see his book, Practical Flow Cytometry there, which I highly recommend. Uh, if you haven't got this book and you're interested in doing any type of flow cytometry, you really owe it to yourself and your lab to get a copy of this book. And it's a tremendous book. I call it the Bible of flow cytometry. But there's one thing that's uh, quite unique about acoustic flow cytometry, and that is that um, it's not mentioned in Howard Shapiro's book. And so that brings me to the uh, interesting discussion now about flow cytometry and how the uh, attune works, because it, it has uh, this unique feature of, of having a different mechanism for aligning cells. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about that because it's one of the most important features, I think, of this instrument. So this is the Attune. It's a, an analyzer. can measure up to 14 colors and two scatter parameters. It's um, an instrument that has the same general features of most instruments. It has a sample delivery a component. It has a fluidic system. It has uh, optics and electronics. And uniquely, it has the acoustic technology. So let's discuss the acoustic technology. Now, 
I'm not sure that too many of you will be familiar with the Journal of the Acoustical Society of America. And probably most of you don't care and will never look at this journal. But I want to show you some of the things that you missed if you haven't looked at this journal. Now, if you were interested in the acoustics of Italian uh, historical opera houses, you would have seen a wonderful paper in a recent uh, um, v v um, journal uh, um, issue of this journal. And if that doesn't tickle your fancy, how would you like to be able to measure the height of a speaker in a room simply from the acoustics? Now, when you think about that, that's pretty amazing. How high is the speaker standing at a lectern just from understanding the acoustic information? Well, that's the sort of paper that you might find in the Journal of Acoustic Society of America. But it's not the only paper. And it turns out that a few years ago, Greg Tadicek published a paper in this same journal. And that paper was entitled Ultrasonic Particle Concentration in a Line-Driven Cylindrical Tube. Naturally, all of you would have searched out this paper and reviewed it and read it and would have fully understood it. Um, well, perhaps not. But had you been looking for this sort of technology, then you would have learned about the beginning of acoustic flow cytometry. So let's look a little bit at the paper that uh, Greg published. So here is a, a picture of his um, tube that he made and on the side here you'll see there's what's called a line source. So what he did was he said, well, I understand what acoustic waves can do. What do they do if I were to put a, a, a acoustic device on the side of a tube? And then he put this tube underneath a microscope and what he saw were some pictures. And I'm explaining it to you here by this little animation. You see that if you put a speaker on the side of a tube, it builds standing waves. And if there were dust in the tube, then that dust would end up being in the center of the tube. And that was like an aha moment for Greg because he realized that the dust particles would be retained in the center cross section of this tube. And what that did was gave him an idea. And these are the pictures that uh, he showed in his paper. So on the left here, you see uh, before the acoustic uh, device here was turned on, and on the right, you see the particles pretty much aligned in the center. And so this was the start of an idea. Now, you don't transform these ideas into technologies without looking at the theory. And just in case any of you would like to double check Greg's equations, I put them up here. I'm sure you'll agree with me that uh, they look great and we'll just move on. But the bottom line is that he tested the theory of this and then built a prototype. Now, if you go back a few years when he built this first prototype of the acoustic system, you'll see here it looks, well, pretty much like a prototype, something that uh, would probably end up uh, things that I build in my lab. Interestingly, his first thoughts on this uh, he brought to uh, people at Los Alamos and he showed them this idea and some of the people at Los Alamos said, you know, you could do this in a, you could build a flow cytometer with this. And the original idea was maybe you could do this without having sheath fluid. And that was the original concept of building a sheathless flow cytometer. 
But as you develop technologies, as I will explain to you in a moment, things don't always work out the way that you start. Here is some um, more material published by Greg, and I want to show you what the effect of this transducer over here is. And on this side, there's a cartoon, and on here is a real image. This is actually originally a video, but I couldn't show the video uh, on, on this system, so I broke up the video into some small sections. So I'll show you, first of all, there we have as the system starts, and this is before acoustic focusing is turned on. And now what we're going to do is turn on the acoustic focusing. So turn it on just a little bit, and you see the cells starting to move to the center. We turn it on a little bit more, and the cells are further in the center. And you can see over here on this side that they're really starting to align quite nicely. And now we've got the acoustic system on full bore. And look at this alignment. They're just perfectly aligned. And over here, the real image, you see that the cells are in the center of the core. And here, of course, is the acoustic waves as they go through the system. So from these early experiments, uh, Greg was able to show, wow, this really will work on a flow cytometer. And there are some advantages to this. And that's really the key point of this webinar is to explain some of the key advantages of acoustic uh, flow cytometry. Now, you're all, I think, familiar with uh, hydrodynamic dynamic focusing. This is what we do in almost every machine. We have a, a sheaf fluid that goes through here. We have a, a tube here, a sample delivery tube. And the cells in here are sort of all over the place. And what we do is we focus them down through this, uh, what Howard Shapiro calls this neck down region here. And they focus down and we have pretty much single cells. But if you increase the pressure on this to go faster with traditional hydrodynamic focusing, you, you don't end up with a good situation. And we've all seen that in our systems that you, you lose some of the integrity or the quality of, of, the, of the data. So what's the difference in an acoustic system? And I want to make a pretty important point at this stage. The, the current version of the acoustic flow cytometer, in fact, the commercial instrument that was built, wasn't exactly the same as the original concept that Greg developed. He developed a concept that was basically sheathless. Sounded like a good idea at the time. But practically, um, it, it is not quite as good as a sheath-based system. And what Greg discovered is when you put the two systems together, that is, you have both the hydrodynamic um, focusing and the acoustic focusing, you get the best of both worlds. Now, you probably can get away without hydrodynamic focusing, which is true because you do this in many of the commercial instruments that are out there which don't have this technology. And that's fine when you're going reasonably slow, but the, the powerful advantage of the combination of acoustic focusing and hydrodynamic focusing is that if you decide to move this system at high speed, then this is where the real advantage is. And I'm going to spend some time talking about that. So let me reiterate a couple of things by showing you some really old slides. These are slides that have been in my class deck for over 20 years. And I try to explain with this slide the, the concept of hydrodynamic focusing of the core here and, and cells coming down the core. And the fact that 
you know, we have a, a laser coming through here somewhere, and at about 90 degrees, we measure the fluorescent signals. And this is all very well, but in fact, in most analyzers, we don't do this, we actually do this. We actually turn the system upside down, we flow upright. And the only time we really flow down is when we're sorting. It's a little bit difficult to sort going up because, well, it would be rather crazy. But for analysis, it's far better to, to flow up. So just wanted to refocus us on how this concept works because this helps us see the difference between uh, a traditional instrument which has hydrodynamic focusing and an instrument that has both hydrodynamic focusing and this acoustic module uh, on the side. And so the advantages here are that by the time the cells reach the hydrodynamic focusing area, they are already in line. And this allows you to increase the flow rate significantly without losing integrity of coefficient of variation, which as we all know is important. So let me summarize a little bit here for what we've been discussing. Why, why does this matter? I always like to ask my question, myself that question. Why does it matter? Why do I care? So the instrument gives best of both worlds because we know that hydrodynamic focusing works well in most instruments that are out there. But when you add acoustic focusing, you get a new dimension. And you'll see that in a little while when I show you some, some different data. And the highly stable flow at high speeds is, is quite difficult to achieve on most instruments, but that's definitely one of the advantages that we see in the Attune. So let's move on and discuss some of the, the other features of the instrument because there are some things that I, I quite like about the instrument and that I think makes it uh, a, a, a very attractive instrument. Let me, let me move to the optics and electronics. So if we take the cover off, which I suspect you're not supposed to do, is this is what you will see. Um, on the left there, and let me block out some of this so that you just focus on some parts of the instrument. There's a lot of stuff here. So we have um, some preamplifiers. You see a bunch of preamplifiers uh, on, on, this, uh, on this instrument. Uh, and the photomultiplier tubes are in, inside there somewhere. And then we have a bunch of dichroic filters that you can see here and uh, a stack of bandpass filters. So this is the core optical assembly that you have on the instrument. And you see here there's a fiber optic coming from somewhere or other. And that is addressing the detectors uh, from, from the, um, the detector system. So coming back to that original picture, this is now showing us um, where the lasers are. And we have the possibility of multiple lasers. The instrument that I have in my lab has four lasers, but I understand that um, you don't have to have four lasers. Uh, you, can have any, you can have three, two, or one. So the blue laser is generally in that position, the yellow or green laser is there, the red laser is over here, and the violet laser, at least the laser we call the violet laser, it's a 405, sort of looks a little bit violet, is down in the front of the instrument. And if you look at the path that those lasers follow, it's pretty much like I've outlined uh, here on this graph. And you'll see that the lasers are actually uh, physically separated from one another by you know, a physical distance so that uh, the cell goes through each 
each laser successively. And there's some advantages to doing that, which I'll discuss in a moment. But let's, for, for a second, look at these lasers. <coughs> They're quite interesting. First thing that I noticed when I pulled the lid off the machine is that the lasers have a slightly different uh, structure to what I was used to. The laser itself is hidden underneath the instrument at the back, but the delivery comes here into this uh, optical assembly here. And you have this uh, round system here that uh, um, is an optical assembly. So what are the lasers? They're actually an OBUS coherent laser, which has been um, designed uh, particularly for this instrument. <coughs> Excuse me. So there are some unique features about the laser. And the first feature is that it's um, fiber optic delivered into this big blob here. And the question is, what is in that blob? So let me clear all these uh, marks that I've made on here so we can look at this optical device. <coughs> there's a number of features. The, the laser comes in here, and then there's a collimating lens that focuses the laser and then there's this thing called a power lens. And what that does, as I'll explain in a moment, is it, it spreads the beam out a little. Instead of it being a perfect Gaussian beam, it gives it a little bit of a wider spread. And there's a value in that that's quite unique in the way that the Attune uses its laser to focus. And then there's a telescope and a, a doublet lens here. I'm actually going to jump this slide and come back to it. <coughs> this is what the laser signal would look like if you were able to, to see this on your machine. Actually, the specification of the laser is such that it has to have this format of beam. <coughs> we call this... Uh, a top hat or um, the Attune uses the term flat top. There's an advantage in this because as you know, we often broaden the laser out a little bit so that when a cell goes through the laser beam that it gets an equal amount of intensity. We don't like having the intensity of the laser beam, which of course is the strongest right here, but it falls off exponentially as it goes down here. So there's a huge difference in intensity at this point if the beam is shaped this way. But that's not the same uh, problem if you have this top hat. And it it's, doesn't really matter if the cell comes in at any of these places, it's going to get the same amount of intensity. Now, you, you might not care about that, but in fact, the quality of your data will change significantly depending on what you're running if you are misaligned a little bit. Now, I'm sure you could still be misaligned on any instrument, but the bottom line is, that you have a better chance of getting better data uh, if you have this broad beam. So, for example, in cell cycle analysis, which I'll mention later, that's actually critical. And you need to be very, very careful. And we'll talk about why the Attune, I think, has some really nice advantages there. Now, um, in talking about the laser and the laser quality and the signal quality, it's something that people have talked about for years and years and I think is now becoming more common in instrument design that 
you get the uh, Levy Jennings pl reports, plots, for every one of your detectors. And the Attune uh, is no different. It, it has that feature, which is uh, very, very important quality control. If you want to review whether or not your instrument has been performing, uh, this is the way to do it. And I strongly recommend that you take note of those plots if you have not been doing so. Something that's very easy to see uh, on the Attune and, and I strongly recommend it. So why does it matter that we care about the quality of the laser, the quality of the signal, the, the reliability of the alignment, etc.? Well, it matters a great deal because the goal of most flow photometry is to get a good quality CV, the best that we can possibly get. And that's what we should strive at. Now, I know it's hard to get great CVs uh, in phenotyping, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't strive to get higher quality CVs. Cell cycle, it's critical. So that's something that you should take note of. And the stability of the signal intensity certainly makes it important for experiments performed over days or months. You want to compare results. You certainly want to know that the, the, the data are uh, compatible from one day to another or comparable, uh, which is probably a more accurate way of saying it. So if you want to be sure that the data are the best, you should strive to calibrate your system and, and make sure that you keep all of these things um, uh, tuned appropriately. And that's, of course, a, a scientific goal that I think everybody has. Well, there's a couple of other things that I, I think are, are, are definitely worth discussing uh, on the Attune, and one of them is the fluidic system. There's a interesting going back here to another slide that I have had for many, many years. The only modification I've made in this slide in 20 years is I added the, the peristaltic uh, section here because that's been something that uh, I've noted in the last several years. Uh, in terms of delivery of samples. But traditionally, there were two types of systems. There was a positive pressure system, and there was a positive displacement syringe system. These have been around for decades. And you know that in the positive pressure system, the key to stable flow here is having uh, a, an appropriate differential pressure between the sample pressure here and the, the pressure on the, the sheath flow in here. And we know that to get nice sample flow here, stable sample flow, non-turbulent flow, we, we need to regulate the pressure here very carefully. And we get this very small differential. And that's how we basically change the rate of flow of cells. It's very different in a positive displacement system. In a syringe system, which is what the Attune is, it's quite different. First thing that we notice is that there's a syringe here. And there's a sample loop of some sort. And then there's your sample. So the goal here is to pull the sample out of your sample tube into some kind of uh, sample loop. And then you change a valve, and then you deliver that at a constant flow rate, and your sample's going through the system. Now, the advantages of the syringe system, as opposed to a positive pressure system, is that syringe systems are innately quantitative. You can measure the absolute flow rate or the absolute number of cells, because you know exactly the volume, you know exactly the length of time that it's run. So that's actually really important. Now, um, I haven't changed this in many years, but this is really no longer true. Uh, the Attune can go much, much faster than this. So that's actually a significant change in uh, the Attune and something that, that I'll address again in a moment. So the concept of a syringe system 
um, allows you to do absolute counts. So this is just a photograph again um, taken the back off the instrument. I'm not sure that you're supposed to do this, but um, unfortunately when an instrument comes in my lab, I tend to pull it to pieces to see how it works. And this gives me a very good understanding of, of how the instrument actually performs. You can see the quality of the construction and how the whole system is designed, how easy it is to, to repair. And um, this is um, the photograph I took of the back of the system. And over here is the syringe. So this is a, 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 a syringe and you put the sample into your sample tube and that's somewhere over there. It's sucked into a sample volume and you might wonder why there's all these uh, parts of this system. But this valve is a fairly complicated valve. And that valve is, um, allows you to pull up sample into a sample loop. It has to have ways of then delivering sample, of cleaning, etc. But uh, this is at the, on the side of the instrument. This is the part that actually delivers the sample to the instrument. And the fluidics environment is over here. Now, something very interesting here about this system. And I mentioned earlier that you know, the original idea of, uh, of, of Greg's was to build and design a system that was uh, sheathless. Well, it didn't turn out quite that way. It isn't sheathless. It's actually less sheath. So that shows that this is the sheath tank, and it's really very small. It's, it's, it's tiny. And this suggests that the instrument is capable of going for extended periods of time uh, with a very small amount of sheath. So that's a, a nice feature about the system, and that uh, whole sheath tank is right here on the, the front of the instrument. Now, while I'm looking at this slide, I haven't discussed the automation yet, but if you had a plate reader on the side of the instrument, it would be sitting here. Uh, I draw your attention to this, this chamber here. If you open that up, you'll see that the, there's a sheath tank here. So this also is very, very small. These are about uh, two inches, maybe 60 millimeters, 50, 60 millimeters in, in size, two or three inches, very small. And uh, so from a, from a sheath system, the, the instrument takes very small. And just uh, another reminder of the fact that because you have this syringe, you have uh, volumetric delivery and absolute count. So again, let me ask the same question, why does it matter? Why do I care? Well, absolute counts will actually save a lot of money. If you don't have a, an instrument that does absolute, uh, absolute counts, then you'll have to buy expensive beads and calibrate those beads. And so, there's an advantage, I think, in doing absolute counts uh, and using a syringe system. The other thing is it's a tremendously stable flow and you have highly controlled sample delivery. And the other advantage, I think, is that you can go from, from, from slow to extremely fast. So. Let's look at the actual sample delivery. And this has got some interesting features that, that I noticed on this instrument too that I found uh, that were quite attractive. So this is the sample tube and the system is you know, pretty much the same as other instruments in that you, you can stick a tube on here. It's a spring-loaded system. It pops up. And the sample uh, collection tube is in the center of the tube and does what uh, most systems do. It just sucks the sample up uh, into a, a loop 
and uh, you're good to go. I, I show you this picture for another reason, and that's because you see a second tube coming here, and this, of course, is where your uh, plates are. What's interesting about this system that uh, I know in my lab we run a lot of plates on the plate reader and one of the things the staff like to do is instead of using a well on the plate to mm, set up the instrument, they like to do it the more traditional way is, is take some sample, put it in a tube, put the tube in the machine and run that tube, set up the voltages, get everything right, and then they're happy that they can then switch over, put their plate in and go. And the advantage is that hidden underneath here is a valve, and that valve has a link between this and this and the system. And so by simply pressing a switch, you can switch from here to here, and you can run the system. That's actually a really, really nice feature. It's a well-engineered uh, system. It's a lot of thought gone into the fact that, yeah, uh, often the time you'll use a tube to, to calibrate a system and, and run a plate on, on your system. So a few features that I mentioned earlier, reasonably good um, dimensionality in in looking at small particles. It has the capacity to use the 405 nanometer um, laser for scatter. And of course, because you reduce the wavelength of the laser to 405, you increase the resolution. So that's a nice feature. But I really want to focus on this feature here. You'll see, you know, not bad resolution here, but the real point that I want to make here is that when you have um, the um, acoustic system that you can run at really quite high rates, even faster than that, but this is a very high rate of, of sample flow and get uh, quite excellent resolution. The other thing is because, as I noted before, the beams are separated, you can run a 561 laser on this instrument. And because of that, you have separated beam, so you can look at your FITSI and your PE signal uh, are with different lasers, and so you can avoid uh, compensation. And that's always a handy feature if, if you can do that. So I just wanted to point that out. So again, why do all these things that I've just discussed matter? Why do I care? Well, I like the mechanism for being able to switch from tube to plate without doing anything but pressing a button. I think that's actually quite nice. And also it's very easily accessible. It's open, so that uh, putting a tube in there. So the technicians uh, in the lab like that very much. And you can flow moderately fast without um, loss of resolution. I, I might actually mm, change this to very fast or extremely fast. Uh, moderately is probably far too conservative a word there, but it definitely is um, very, very fast. And having onboard QC, etc., cetera, will, will certainly help you. So there's a couple more features that I'll mention in, in the last uh, few minutes of, of my presentation. And one of these is, is automation. I've already shown the fact that you can uh, put um, micro teeter plates in here and, and run your micro teeter plates uh, directly into the system. It can be permanently hooked up, and in my lab it is permanently hooked up, and we switch frequently from running uh, tubes in here to running plates in here. So that's, 
the first feature, but um, a, a feature that I haven't yet tested, but I have seen it uh, in operation out in Eugene, Oregon at Thermo's site is their uh, automation system. So, so what they've done is they've taken uh, their uh, orbiter system, which can sort of grab a bunch of plates from here and, and pop them in here and then put them back. And uh, my understanding that this can be done in a uh, temperature controlled environment, uh, in heated, cooled, whatever, and you can, of course, use uh, an incubator, uh, an automated incubator uh, here. So this is a system I haven't uh, tried or tested, but I have seen it in operation. So I understand that this is the next thing. So I'm sure that there are plenty of people out there that uh, are, are may well be interested in, in that as a feature. And I will point out that, of course, you can't use the, the small uh, container for sample fluid if you're going to run vast numbers of plates. You've, you've really got to have a bigger system. So I, I put these two pictures there almost in comparison of size. This is sort of a relative size, and this is a, quite a large container that sits on the floor, and that's required for the high, high number of plates if you are going to run the uh, fully automated system. So that is there. Again, haven't tested it, but I've seen it operating. So why, do, why does this matter? Well, I think if you're in an environment where you wanted to run a large number of plates, the one thing that's for sure is that automation is, is, is a very good thing. Running plates, I've found over the last several years that I've been running a lot of microtutor plates on flow cytometers and preparing a lot of plates using automated preparation systems that they're uh, is a reduction in error. So robots do exactly what you tell them to do. They are extremely reliable. They don't get sick. They don't charge overtime. They'll work all night if you want them to. And they repeat things with precision. So if you're doing a preparation of microtutor plates, and, and, and I suppose if you have one plate to prepare, then it, it's probably not worthwhile. But if you have three, four plates to prepare for an assay, it's no question in my mind that, that automation improves the quality of the data because the volume distribution is, is precise. The, uh, it facilitates um, timing if you have to add uh, timing uh, in, in your assay, if you're doing phosphoassays or something like that, you, you've got to stop uh, the, the reaction at a certain point and it's got to be precise and you want the same every time. So that, that has to be done and robots are very good at doing that. Okay, so um, let me now briefly mention cell cycle analysis and I've got just half a dozen more slides. Uh, in, in the webinar. So cell cycle analysis is something that we've been doing in flow cytometry for literally 40 years. It was the tool of choice in early flow cytometry days. You know, there was a day when people didn't do much else but cell cycle analysis. And one of the things that you know for sure if you do cell cycle analysis is that you cannot run samples quickly. It is the slowest, probably most boring type of flow cytometry because you've just got to run things slowly. And the reason is you need good CVs. If you don't have good CVs, there's no way you're going to tell the difference between a very small change in nucleic acid because that's what you're measuring. So we know that it takes several minutes per sample. It's very time consuming and therefore it's expensive. It's not expensive for reagents. They're not expensive. It's the time, the technician time and the lab time and the flow cytometry time that will really kill you if you're going to run cell cycle analysis. Well, that's just, that model doesn't work with the Attune. In fact, it's completely changed. And and I, I'm, I'm really quite amazed 
at this because because of the acoustic focusing, it's a total paradigm shift with the attune. And my suspicion is that people who aren't doing cell cycle analysis, simply because of the reasons that I've mentioned, uh, will uh, do it uh, if they have this instrument because uh, it, it's almost a pleasure to do cell cycle analysis. You can run those samples through at much higher speed and get high quality CVs. And if you do this on a plate, and this is something that I never thought I would see, but if you run an entire plate of cell cycle, well, there's several things that happen. First of all, the analysis is a cinch. One of the things that I've learned over the last several years of running lots of plates is that uh, software is not well defined to look at plates. Why, I don't know. Because it's a perfect opportunity. You know where everything is. Plate uh, formats are fixed. You've got 96 well, you have 384 well, etc. So when uh, we looked at uh, cell cycle analysis, one of my staff looked at this and just wrote some software that analyzes cells. Why do you want to look at cell cycle analysis like this? I'll tell you why. This is a very, very simple reason. So let's say you're interested in seeing whether or not there's a change. Whoops, I've got the wrong, uh, the wrong marker. I discovered that you can actually draw a straight line if you pick the right one. But look at this. You can look to see whether or not there's a change in your G0, G1, or G2M. Now, of course, you're just looking at the cells, but, but what you're doing here is you're saying to yourself, oh, which ones should I look at in more detail? And you can uh, choose the ones that you want to look at in more detail, or you can ignore some of the ones that nothing much happened. So this is one reason. And the other reason is, sure, it's all very well to look down that way, but um, one of the things that, uh, that uh, my staff member did when we looked at this was he said, well, just click a button and rotate everything so that they're actually going in this direction. And now you can look at the rows as well, uh, changes in rows as well as columns, because it never occurred to me when I looked at this that, yeah, it's all very well to look down the column, but uh, there are things called rows as well. So that's just one thing. And the Attune uh, is able to do cell cycle analysis um, uh, in an entire plate. Again, something that I never thought anyone would ever do. Just to show you the impact of speed. And here we have very, uh, well, slow, normal speed, very fast, what I called really fast, and something that I've, whoops, I've termed uh, ridiculously fast. I, I, I would never believe that anyone would run cell cycle analysis at, at this sort of speed. But look at this, absolutely superb CVs at this rate. And can it be done and can you do really good work? Well, I'm going to show you something from my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Jake Jagerberger. This is really complicated stuff and Jake uh, showed some of this data at a recent meeting and was very uh, generous in, in sharing some of his slides with me, which I understand are going to be published very shortly in, in this book that I've uh, referenced here. But look at the detail and quality of the work that Jake did. And Jake did all of this, all of his cell cycle analysis uh, on, a, on a tune and, and running them on, on plates. And uh, just absolutely gorgeous work in great detail. This tells me that uh, this is a transformational moment in, in cytometry that, that you can do cell cycle analysis uh, at moderately or at high speed. Certainly the sort of speed that you can, you can do your cell cycle experiments in an entire 96 well plate and run them automatically and then uh, have a, a, a very rich data set to analyze. This to me is a transformational uh, thing in cytometry. So why does all this matter? And I'm going to finish up uh, with a, a summary in, in my next slide. Why does all this matter? Well, cell cycle 
is something that uh, I have always sort of hated doing. Uh, it's, it, and not just me, the technicians in the lab don't like doing it at all because it's so slow and everything has to be so perfect. Um, and you've got to be so worried about blockages and keeping the flow rate nice and stable. But actually, that's not the case with the Attune. And you can get excellent CVs at really pumping those, uh, those cells through the Attune uh, very fast. And, and I really uh, am amazed at that. And I wouldn't have, have thought that was the case uh, until I sat down and actually saw the data. So that's why I think it matters. And uh, let me now uh, finish my seminar and, and summarize some of the things that I've said. Now, I've really tried to, in the last uh, 55 minutes, just give my personal impression of the instrument, how we use the instrument, what I like about it, what I think are, are important. And so uh, the, the acoustic focusing feature, something that I heard about and it's been around for several years now and I really had to sit down and think about and actually have a talk with Greg Katerchek just to find out uh, exactly how did this work and why is it so good and I'm really convinced that it's a, a really uh, excellent uh, piece of technology. The, the fact that it also is combined with a sample delivery system it can provide absolute counts and that you can combine both of those things with um, hydrodynamic focusing means that you get excellent data. That the, the laser lines are delivered with a top hat that's uh, really finely tuned in, in a way that uh, alignment is uh, less going to affect your results. And if you do phenotyping, you want to do a lot of samples, you can, you can look at uh, 14 colors. Uh, with four lasers and this, this uh, separation of the four beams means you, you have less compensation issues to deal with because you can set your system up in a way that, uh, that is easier to, to manage. The, the ability to switch from tubes to, to plates, I think it's a really uh, clever engineering feature. And the other thing that I didn't spend any time on this seminar, but I'll mention it briefly now, is that you can run incredibly dilute samples. And I, I heard a story of um, that Greg told me that someone had dropped a sample on the floor and there was almost nothing left in the sample. And Greg said to the, the, the scientist, oh, look, just put some, more, put some saline in there and we'll run the sample. And they did and they got great data out of it. And the reason is you can run that volume through the system in a reasonable time and by the combination of acoustic and hydrodynamic focusing, you're going to get excellent quality data on very few cells. Finally, you can run cell cycle on this system at very fast, a very fast rate and get a good reduction in CV. And I've already mentioned the automation with the robotics and that may well be of interest to a number of people. So let me finally acknowledge the assistance I got from uh, Jolene Bradford uh, at Thermo for her support. Uh, for our laboratory, which I, I uh, gratefully acknowledge, for uh, Greg uh, Katerchek and Michael Ward from Thermo, who uh, put up with me for a few days uh, to uh, literally pull the, uh, the attune to pieces and let me see the inner workings so that I can understand how it works uh, and give me a, a better understanding of that instrument. I really appreciate that, uh, that uh, support to Kathy Rajab, uh, who's a flow technician in my lab, who's running the uh, tune uh, and, and runs our data, and Jenny Sturgis, uh, Valeri Patserkin, and Bartek Riva, who, who support my lab and, and, uh, and, and, and give me the assistance that, uh, that I have uh, to produce the data that uh, we publish. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Judy, and uh, I thank you uh, for your attention during this webinar. Thank you for that presentation, Dr. Robinson. We want to get right to your questions and input, so here's a reminder as to how audience members can communicate with us. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A button at the lower left. If we are unable to get to your question due to time constraints, Thermo Fisher Scientific will reach out to you via email. And our first question is, 
Why can you do cell cycle faster on the Attune NXT? I thought cell cycle was always run at very slow cell analysis rates. Uh, well, that's a, a great question. Thank you. Um, I, I've sort of spent a bit more time on that than uh, I see that we're already at 59 minutes here. But the bottom line is because you can align with both hydrodynamic focusing and acoustics, you can guarantee that those cells are perfectly in line and that you can go faster, um, that when you go faster, you don't just broaden the core by allowing the cells to move away. They can't because they're focused in the center by, by the acoustic system. And that's the real reason why a cell cycle runs faster, something that I hadn't thought about before. Can you clarify that the Attune NXT has both acoustic focusing and hydrodynamic focusing, and why are they both needed? Well, as I said before, the original concept that Greg had was it, that you, you really didn't need anything else. You didn't need acoustic uh, uh, hydrodynamic focusing because you could actually go with a, with a uh, sheath-less system. But as he found out when he designed and built the instrument, it works better. It, it, the, the bottom line is that uh, the combination of the two just works better. And um, when you build systems and test them, and you prototype them, you find out what works better, and uh, that I suspect was developed through uh, many prototypes. And the the bottom line is that we know that hydrodynamic focusing works well, and if you combine the two, then uh, you get a much better system. Thank you. Wonderful questions coming in. We have time for just one more. Why did you say that the Attune NXT can look at samples with very low cell counts? It seems to me this is a fundamental problem with most flow cytometers. Yes, that is true. And you really get worried if you have very few cells in the sample. And we've probably all been in the situation where we've got very few cells and but we want to get a, a, a sense of what the measurement is without losing our cells. And um, the, the problem is that very difficult. So on the Attune, the reason is that because you can acoustically focus it, uh, each of the cells that you have, you, you, can, you can force those cells to remain in that perfectly alignment thing and you can have them coming one after the other at, at long distances and still, be, so in other words, you have very dilute sample, but you can run that sample at, at a high volume rate. So, so if you ended up with uh, two mils of sample and you only had 50 cells, with most flow cytometers, you would be sitting there for a long time. You would just not be able to find those cells. But with the Attune, you, you, you can run at a high volume, several hundred micro, microliters per second, and still be sure that those cells are going to come through and focus. And so that's the reason that you can, you can run at a high volume of, uh, of sample and still focus on those few cells that are there. I would like to once again thank Dr. Robinson for his presentation. Do you have any final comments? No, I've enjoyed uh, the opportunity to do the presentation. I'm sure that uh, if um, I've gone a little over time, I apologize. And I'm sure questions are coming. I'll be more than happy to answer those uh, either publicly or privately. And my, 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 uh, the uh, links to my website and um, my YouTube uh, and um, Facebook are, are there so people can find me and track me down. Well, thank you again to Dr. Robinson. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand until November 2017. Keep an eye out for an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We encourage you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you next time. Bye.